So, so we are starting today. Let's let's get it together. Here. Uh, we are starting today, and we're going to talk about um, the the rise of Nazism in Germany. This really mirrors uh, the the first lectures we did about Japan, the lectures we did in the last couple of days about the rise of Italian fascism. How are we getting these three countries, Japan and Italy and Germany, ultimately to be allies, ultimately to be starting a second world war? Uh, for Germany, we're going to not go quite as far back because you guys already know a little bit of the origin story of Germany because that's what leads us to World War I. For Germany, we're going to go back to the, uh, the outcome of the First World War. And I want to make it absolutely clear to everyone right now that Germany loses World War I. But when Germany loses World War I, they are losing in France. They are losing in Belgium. Never are they driven from France and Belgium back into Germany. The story of World War I and World War II are two very different stories for Germany at, at their ends. The end of World War II finds Germany having Berlin surrounded by, by Soviet soldiers and American soldiers marching into Western Germany. The end of World War I happens when German soldiers are still fighting on a Western front in France and in Belgium. A really quick reminder of the end of the First World War. In 1917, don't write this, you've already got it written somewhere. In 1917, there's two revolutions in Russia. First revolution topples the Tsar because people are so frustrated with him and how the war is going. The second revolution topples that provisional government that still did refuse to get uh, Russia out of the war. The new government, led by Vladimir Lenin, immediately begins negotiating an exit from World War I. That exit will come in March of 1918 with the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. At that point, thousands, hundreds of thousands of German soldiers are thrown onto trains from the Eastern Front to get to the Western Front, where German military leadership, guys named Paul von Hindenburg and Eric Ludendorff, just hear their names right now, they, they put together plans for a final offensive. Now, they don't really call it the final offensive. They call it the Ludendorff offensive or the spring offensive. Because they didn't know it was going to be their final offensive. All right? Where they're going to throw their, the rest of their armies against the, the Allied front. And they're going to hopefully, in their minds, break through the Allied lines, cut France off from resupply, get France to surrender, win the war. They throw everything that they have against those western lines. And you can notice that they push further than they've pushed at any other point in the war. Uh, in 1918, the, uh, July, August 1918, May of 1918, uh, September of 1918, these are some of the deepest pushes, uh, deepest offensives by the German army. But at the same time this is going down, the Americans are beginning to arrive in greater numbers. And German military leadership never breaking through the Allied lines. They pushed them, they didn't break them. Never breaking through. They are going to recognize by, by November of 1918 that this war can't be won on the battlefield. And they will make a decision. And it's a decision that has to be made quickly because the Allies are now being resupplied with American material and American troops. They want this war to end before the Allies have what's called a counteroffensive, before they are driven back. They would much rather sign a treaty or an agreement to end this war while they are in France than while they're in the German countryside when they get pushed back ultimately. And the German countryside is starting to get ugly. People are angry in Germany. People are hungry in Germany because of the British blockade. Many sailors are starting to mutiny up in the northern port cities, quit the war, because they had some of the worst existence battling this war on German U-boats. The king, the Kaiser, Kaiser Wilhelm II, will abdicate his throne amidst political chaos. And it looks like the German nation is teetering here. So military leadership in Germany and the new government of Germany says we need to get out of this war now. If we wait till tomorrow, it might be too late for us to, to save any face in any kind of peace agreement. And they want this peace to be based on Woodrow Wilson's 14 points. Woodrow Wilson was an internationalist to the truest sense of the word. He wanted to set up an international system that would prevent a war like this from ever happening again. 
And for Woodrow Wilson, the 14 points, and for Germany, the 14 points is actually a pretty good outcome. Because if the war could end based on the 14 points, Germany wouldn't be dismantled. Europe would be put back together with an intact Germany. Sure, there would be some losses. Germany might lose some territory. But they would be largely held intact. And that's what the German military leadership wants. So on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month of 1918, an armistice is signed. And you can see that in this blue line here. That is going to be the ultimate line of the armistice, of the ceasefire. German troops over here, French and British and American troops over here, and then we'll work on a treaty. But notice that that, that armistice line is not in Germany. German troops were never pushed back into Germany. There were no battles in Western Germany in World War I. And this is going to lead some in Germany extremely bitter and angry about the outcome of this war. Some will call it the stab-in-the-back theory. That socialists and Jews in the German government stabbed the German military in the back and stabbed the German people in the back, betrayed them by exiting this war that was not truly lost. And in fact, not only was it not lost, when, when the Allies and the Germans stopped fighting, Germany was like closer to Paris in many cases than they were to the border of Germany. It, didn't not, it not only seemed like the war wasn't lost, it seemed like to many that they were winning the war. And this is what German propaganda had told them for four years, that they were winning the war. And yet, they back out of the war. After the war, we go to Versailles. We go to Paris, the Paris Peace Conference. And out of the Paris Peace Conference comes the Treaty of Versailles. The Treaty of Versailles is a compromise list of punishments against Germany. Never as harsh as France truly wanted. More harsh than Britain and America ever wanted. And to what the Germans feel is a dictated treaty. A treaty that they sign under duress. I'm going to give you the laundry list of punishments that Germany suffers. You've probably heard all this before. You'll hear it again. Germany will have its air region known as the Rhineland. This, this river along the western part of Germany is called the River Rhine, the Rhine River. And the territory surrounding the Rhine River is resource and industry rich Rhineland. When Germany invaded Belgium, they sent their troops through the Rhineland to march into Belgium. The Rhineland is also the border between Germany and France. So the Rhineland will be demilitarized. Germany will not be allowed to keep troops in the Rhineland. It will also be occupied by League of Nations soldiers from France and from Belgium. The Saar region of Germany, or the Saarland, S-A-A-R, that's this little area. It's a rich coal-producing region of Germany. The Saar's coal production for 15 years would go directly to France. And within 15 years, the people of the Saar would be able to hold a plebiscite. A plebiscite. It gets its name from, remember in ancient Rome, classical Rome, the plebeians or the plebs? Uh, the plebeians were like the common people. A plebiscite is a fancy word that means we're going to let the people vote. We're going to let the people decide. In our country, we call those referendums. P-L-E-B-I-S-C-I-T-E. -E. Plebiscite. We're going to let the people vote. So within 15 years, the people of the Tsar are going to vote on whether they want to be a part of France or they want to be a part of Germany. 15 years after 1919 takes us to 1934. You have to come back next week to find out how that vote goes. It's the cliffhanger part of this class, right? Alsace and Lorraine. 
those two disputed territories that were taken by Germany or taken by France in the uh, pardon me, taken by Germany in the Franco-Prussian War, will be given back to France after World War One. The Treaty of Versailles will forbid what is called Anschluss. Anschluss. A-N-S-C-H-L-U. It's called a Scharfes S in German. It's like two S's put together into one letter. No Anschluss with Germany. The hills are alive with the sound of Anschluss. If you've ever seen the sound of music, that's what this is all about. Austria's got a bunch of German people in it. Germany's got a bunch of German people in it. The Treaty of Versailles does not want to see those two German states join into one, stronger one. The German word for political union is Anschluss. But forevermore, when you hear the word Anschluss in this class, know that it means the union between Germany and Austria. You'll have to tune in tomorrow or next week to see if that really is going to happen. Side note, the Treaty of St. Germain that Austria signs with the, uh, the victors, it also forbids a union with Germany. They're not allowed to join up with each other. Everybody good at, up to this point? On, uh, Austria can't do it either. Austria can't join with Germany. Germany can't join with Austria. In the eastern part of Germany, a new nation will be born called Poland. It's a new nation that was an old nation, but now it's a new nation again. Called Poland. And out of German territory especially northern German territory, will be the creation of what's called the Polish Corridor. The Polish Corridor, which gives the new nation of Poland access to the Baltic Sea. It gives them a seaport. It gives them access to sea. But what the Polish Corridor does is it bisects the nation of Germany. So this is Germany, but so is this. It's the part of Germany that's going to be known as East Prussia. But it's the German nation. German nation, German nation, separated by Polish corridor. All right? Germany is going to lose their colonies. Germany is going to be demilitarized to an army of only 100,000 men, which is very, very, very klein in German, very small. The German army in World War I had millions of men in it. German army after World War I has 100,000. That is barely a defensive force. No navy, well, I take that back, a small navy, only six battleships in the German navy are going to be allowed, with no submarines. Germany gets no submarines. Remember unrestricted submarine warfare being an issue? Germany won't have submarines anymore. No air force, or as we will call it in Germany, the Luftwaffe. That means air force. Some of you, if you've ever flown to Europe, you might have been on an airliner called Lufthansa. The Luft is the German word for air. Or you might be an 80s fan, an 80s music fan, and you might know the 99 Luftballons. That classic ditty about 99 balloons and nuclear holocaust. Remember that one? The 80s were a serious time. You think the music is frivolous, but there's some serious themes going on. All right. Germany is forced to sign what is called Article 231 of the Treaty of Versailles, which is the War Guilt Clause. Article 231, the War Guilt Clause. They have to accept responsibility for the war, which then can make them legally responsible to pay reparations. That's a lot of punishments, right? Reparations, these, these payments for the cost of the war incurred by the British and the French and the Belgians and Italians. It's a lot of punishments. Now we'll talk about this guy. Adolf Hitler was an Austrian-born soldier in the German army. When World War I began, Adolf Hitler looked at like the tail of the tape and said, do I want to fight in Austria 
against Serbs and Russians and later Italians? Or do I want to hop and be a part of the best military on the planet in Germany? He hopped the border. And he went from Austria, which is right down here, he went from Austria to southern Germany, a region of Germany, a state of Germany called Bavaria. If you are familiar with the BMW, that is Bavarian Motor Works. It's a state of Germany. It's Bavaria. He went down to southern Germany and he joined a Bavarian unit of the German military. And by all accounts, he fought the First World War with distinction. He was awarded an Iron Cross, which is a prestigious award in, in the German military. And as the war came to an end, he was one of these Germans, one of these German veterans, who believed in the stab in the back theory. That the war wasn't really lost by soldiers on the front because they were winning the war, he thought. That the war was fought, rather, by politicians back in Germany. And he would call those politicians in Germany that negotiated the end of the war and ultimately signed the Treaty of Versailles. He would call them the November criminals. 11th, 11th, 11 November, 1918, the November criminals. That's where that comes from. And his disgust with the end of the war and his disgust with the Treaty of Versailles would radicalize and politicize Adolf Hitler. It would turn Adolf Hitler into a political animal to avenge the outcome of World War I. After the war, Adolf Hitler is actually it's still a member of the military. He's actually sent to kind of investigate a political party known as the German Workers' Party. Look into it. Because there were some in the government that believed that the German Workers' Party was maybe trying to subvert the government. And he was looking for, like, left-wing radical subversion. But instead of investigating it, he joined it. And Hitler will quickly become a vocal leader of this German Workers' Party. Under his young leadership, the party will be renamed the National Socialist German Workers' Party. Deutsches Arbeiters Party, Arbeiter Party, German Workers' Party. It becomes the National Socialists. National Socialists, or at least the German pronunciation of national or national, is where we get the word Nazi from. So Nazi, the Nazi party, is the abbreviated National Socialist German Workers Party. So Adolf Hitler will become a young leader of this new party in Germany. He will give them a symbol to rally around, that is the swastika. Because he thought it was a cool symbol. He organizes stormtroopers or what is known as the SA in Germany. The SS will come a little bit later. These are Hitler's brown shirts. Because he thought that, that Benito Mussolini and his black shirts was such a good idea. Except he didn't want it to be the black shirts because then it would be associated with just Mussolini. So we got to give him make more brown shirts. So Hitler's SA, these are his brown shirts, these are his stormtroopers, and Time out really quickly, just kind of interesting pop, color, uh, pop culture factoid. It is no surprise that George Lucas named the, the bad guys in the, in the Empire in Star Wars stormtroopers. There is a lot of like Nazi ideology and Nazi imagery within, within the Star Wars universe. And in the evil galactic empire, much is borrowed from the evil Nazi empire from the style of uniforms of the officers on the, uh, the Death Star, very similar to the Hugo Boss designed Nazi uniform. Those of you that are big into fashion, and you might even be sporting Hugo Boss clothes at some point, Hugo Boss was the designer for, for, for Nazi Germany. Hey, Nazis were driving around in BMWs and Volkswagens too. So, so don't, like, there's a lot of German companies that existed uh, before, uh, before World War II that are still around today. 
Anyway, um, he organized his own thugs, his own um, enforcers within his own National Socialist German Workers' Party. All right. What are Hitler's goals as a leader of this new party in Germany? He's got a few of them. First, first, I'm going to give you three words for the same thing. Why don't you hear them first, and then you can just write down your favorite. He believes in pan-Germanism, or all Germans standing together. Because there's Germans in Germany, of course, but there's also Germans in Austria. And there's Germans in Czechoslovakia. And there's Germans in Poland. And he believes all Germans should be united into one country. You could use the word pan-Germanism for that. Or you could use the German, Großes Deutschland. Big Germany. Gross Deutschland. Or you could use the phrase Greater Germany. A Germany for German people. So we wanted to unify all German-speaking people. He wanted to make this unified Germany racially pure. He wanted to make this unified Germany racially pure. And this leads to us talking for a moment about much of the pseudoscience, like kind of today we recognize as fake science, of the early 20th century. All right? This is not just what Adolf Hitler thought. This is not just what like, radical racists thought. That like, the earth was made up of all different kinds of races, and some of those races were superior to others. This was mainstream thinking. In fact, right around the corner from us, one of the finest institutions on the planet, the University of Michigan, was a hotbed for uh, research in what is known as the eugenics movement. You guys have heard of the eugenics movement? This was um, the pseudoscience of the day that said, that in, in borrowed much of like Charles Darwin's theories of evolution, but applied to the human race. What you guys might have also heard the phrase social Darwinism. Like, like in nature, there's a survival of the fittest, and, and species either adapt or they go extinct. Well, in the human race, social Darwinists attributed some of the same ideas to the human existence and said that some human races have adapted and evolved over time and are superior to others that haven't. And just like in the natural world where there's a survival of the fittest, in the human race, there are, are, there are more fit races for survival. All right? And a map like this, which is from the early 20th century Germany, lays out all the different races of the world. All right? or, or at least in, in this picture of the map, Af North Africa and Europe and Asia. And Adolf Hitler placed his German Aryan race, as he called it, as the supreme of all. One note, you remember from AP World History, Aryan invasions of, of, of the South Asian continent, all right? When Indo-European, Indo-European, kind of between India and Europe, Indo-European Aryans went down into India taking ideas that ultimately evolve into Hinduism and whatnot with them. Um, and they kind of, in, in Adolf Hitler's mind, bring civilization to India, all right? These would be like where the lighter-skinned folks of northern India have come from, all right? Hitler believes that those Aryans are, are, are part of the same origins that eventually took those white folks to Europe, all right? And that's where civilization comes from. It gets so wacky, and this is backed by, by, by sociologists of the time, that like the great civilization of India is really brought by white folks. Well, how did Chinese get their great civilization? Well, some white folks got onto boats from India and went over to China and hooked them up with some cool stuff. It's mental. It doesn't line up with actual historical research and evidence today. But it's certainly what Hitler bought into. So another part of his goal is to make a racially pure nation, German nation. So a greater Germany, but with only Germans in it. So to drive out non-German populations. A major focus of this is going to be targeted against the Jews in, in Germany. And the Jews in other areas of Europe that would eventually, in Hitler's mind, become a part of Germany. 
He saw them as inferior, what we can say in German, Untermensch, or inferior peoples. Also included with the Jews would be Slavic peoples and Poles and Ukrainians. Um, these, these didn't fit in to Hitler's idea of a German master race. Now, beyond races, Hitler saw that he has some natural enemies as nations. The Soviet Union being preeminent. The Soviet Union, large Jewish minority in the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union, mostly Slavic peoples. The Soviet Union, communist. And Hitler does not like communists. The Soviet Union, more land and resources, more Lebensraum than any other uh, territory. I'll mention Lebensraum in a second. Actually, I need to mention Lebensraum right now. This is the third part. I kind of skipped this. The third goal, greater Germany, racially pure Germany, the acquisition of Lebensraum. Lebensraum is the German word for living space or living room. There's 85 million Germans in Europe. They need room to stretch their legs. They need room to settle. They need room to grow more food. They need room to, to develop more industry. I said that oddly. Industry. I put the emphasis on the wrong syllable there for a second. <laughs> um, they need more resources. And that, that, that Lebensraum can... Uh, and come from the Soviet Union. Mind you, who lives in what is going to be Lebensraum? Poles and, and Ukrainians and, and all kinds of other people, Jews. They're going to need to be driven out eventually. Now, going back, natural national enemies to the Germans, the Soviet Union, I already mentioned that, and France. France has long been a rival to Germany. France took back Alsace and Lorraine. France dictated the harsh punishment of the Treaty of Versailles to Germany. Hitler wants to destroy France. And then he's got possible allies going forward. Adolf Hitler kind of digs what Benito Mussolini is doing. In fact, in many respects, he's going to follow Mussolini's playbook. And Hitler actually likes Britain. They've got a similar, like, German heritage. Like, you guys know how English is kind of an ugly language? And, like, Germany, German's kind of harsh-sounding? Not those pretty languages, like Italian and French, romantic languages, but, but ugly English, right? Like, do you know how to say English in German? English. <laughs> All right, it's the same thing. Um, so anyway, he also envies the German Empire, the, the British Empire. My, Britain, you certainly have created a nice empire for yourself. I kind of like what you do and how you treat the rest of the world. I have some of the same ideas. And then um, Italy, we've already, of course, mentioned. So how does Adolf Hitler then go from having these grandiose ideas to ultimately putting them into play? Now we go to the 1920s. Or maybe even start in 1919. And a struggle in the government of Germany. Hey, guys, have you noticed now? that Japan becomes the World War II Japan because of political instability. And Italy becomes the World War II Italy because of political instability. Germany will become the World War II Germany because of political instability. Right? This is part of the stuff that makes us a little bit concerned about the political instability of our own nation today. Right? Like, man... It's not cool to be so divided where there's a lot of really angry people. And some even arguing that if the election doesn't turn out one way, it's got to be fixed. That makes for a politically unstable country. Back to, to Germany. Can we do a favor? Can you do me a favor? We still want to call it Germany. We don't want to forget that it's Germany. But let's call for Germany for the next few minutes the Weimar Republic. Weimar. W. Because Germany has W's that sound like V's. The Weimar Republic. Weimar is a city in Germany. Weimar is a city in Germany. You can see it right here. Not there. We've got to go all the way back to this one. You can see Weimar right here. 
And the new German state after World War I will be known as the Weimar Republic. Still Germany. But we'll call that Germany the Weimar Republic because that's where the new constitution will be written, in the German city of Weimar. All right? We need to call it the Weimar Republic for a little bit. There's a lot of problems in the Weimar Republic. There's a lot of political instability. In 1919, there's an attempt by communists in the Weimar Republic to topple that government in an event known as the Spartacist Revolt. We don't need to know much about it outside that it happened, and it brought some political chaos to the young Weimar Republic. Assassinations in Weimar, Germany were commonplace. Between 1919 and 1922, there were 350 political assassinations alone throughout Germany. I don't like these kinds of stories, but in a way I do, because they remind me that today, despite the seeming chaos that we live in, we ain't that bad on a historical scale, right? Like, political assassinations are, I, I can't even use the word rare. They, like, don't seem to happen, right? Or at least, if they do happen, like when Gabby Giffords was shot a couple years ago, that doesn't seem to be as politically motivated as it is just some screw-loose motivations, right? So political assassinations are kind of a thing of the best. Yes, ma'am? 1919 and 1922, just the early years of Weimar Germany. So, so political assassinations happening left and right. In January of 1923, an event known as the Ruhr Crisis. The Ruhr, R-U-H-R. The Ruhr is an industrially rich region of West Germany. Germany was forced, because of the Treaty of Versailles, to pay some pretty harsh reparations payments to Belgium and France and Britain. Well, Germany was broke as a joke. They just lost the war. And they were having a hard time making these payments. In December of 1922, Germany missed a payment. In January of 1923, French and Belgian soldiers marched in and occupied the Ruhr. A German reach. They invaded Germany. The German government tells the workers of the Ruhr, the German government tells the workers of the Ruhr, hey, just passively resist. Go on strike. Don't do your jobs. Don't produce for the French and the Belgians. But how am I going to feed my family? How am I going to pay my bills? That's okay. We, as the government, will pay you. And the German government started printing new marks to pay these workers who weren't working. And this will lead to rapidly a hyperinflation crisis in Germany. Inflation is a decreasing in the value of your currency, which leads to an increase in prices. If I say your dollar bill is only worth half of what it is or what it was yesterday, when you go to McDonald's, your dollar menu McChicken sandwich is now going to cost two dollars because that dollar isn't what it, worth what it used to be worth. All right? Well, Germany will not only go through inflation, they will go through what's known as hyperinflation, ridiculously rapid inflation that devalues the currency of Germany and makes people's money virtually worthless. So you might be paid a salary, but that salary is worthless. You might have money in savings, but that money in savings will now be rendered, rendered worthless. You might collect a pension from the government, but now that pension is worthless. This is a disaster for the German economy. But in the end, the Ruhr crisis ultimately didn't work out that bad. Because the Ruhr crisis actually would bring international sympathy to Germany. Oh, France, don't you think you're being a little difficult on Germany? Why don't you give them a break, right? Like, let's ease up. And actually, in the aftermath of the Ruhr crisis, Germany is going to have some of its reparations payments restructured. 
so they can more easily make those payments. We'll talk about that in a moment. Feeding on this popular anger and this economic crisis of hyperinflation, Adolf Hitler and his new German or National Socialist German Workers' Party will attempt to stage an uprising that is known as the Beer Hall Putsch. Because it starts in a beer hall. Because there's a lot of those in Germany. A putsch is like, a, like an uprising. The Beer Hall Putsch. Starting in Munich, Germany. This is in southern Germany. In 1923, Adolf Hitler and his Nazis hoped to start a little uprising in southern Germany. And from there, march north to the city of Berlin. We grab that door. March north to the city of Berlin and bring down the Weimar government. Kind of sounds like what? Does that sound familiar? What's that? Am I hearing anywhere? Mussolini? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Mussolini and his march on Rome in, in, in October of 1922. Hitler was watching what was going on. Mussolini's got black shirts. Hitler's got brown shirts. Mussolini's got 40,000 black shirts. Okay, so Hitler's only got 600 brown shirts right now. But he's still going to try. And you can imagine where it goes. It fails. The police open fire on the rioters. 16 SA brown shirts are going to be killed. Adolf Hitler is arrested. He's put on trial. And in his trial, he gains more public notoriety, more public fame than he would have ever gotten from just a failed revolution on its own. He's convicted, sentenced to five years in prison, of which he will be released after one year. Mental note, if you arrest radical revolutionaries, keep them in prison for as long as you can. All right? <laughs> Are bad. He's released after a year. He was such a good prisoner because he was spending his year writing his book. His book is called Mein Kampf, My Struggle in Germany, or in German, German language, Mein Kampf. And in that book, he lays out much of his plans for Germany, like creating a greater Germany, like creating a racially pure Germany, like the acquisition of Lebensraum for Germany. Mental note, if you arrest a radical revolutionary and he writes a book, maybe take it seriously. But it wasn't taken seriously. No one bought it. Just like you could go online right now and find probably a thousand different radical American revolutionaries putting manifestos online on their blogs. And we read them and we're like, Okay, get your tinfoil hat out, all right? <laughs> and we don't give it much credit. This book was a, was a dud. It didn't sell. It didn't sell so much so that when Hitler put, wrote a second book, it was published as Hitler's Zeitus Buch, his second book. He didn't come up with a very good name for it. And it didn't sell either. The only way to make Mein Kampf sell was for Hitler to ultimately become Der Fuhrer of Germany and essentially require German citizens to buy it. Then it becomes a bestseller. <laughs> Side note, it is becoming a bestseller again today in many markets, especially in markets that are particularly loathsome of the nation of Israel. Um, in, in bookstores in the Middle East and in Palestinian territories, Mein Kampf is, it sells like hotcakes again. After prison, Hitler recognizes that maybe violent revolution is not the way to go. And he's going to try to achieve political leadership through legal channels. But this becomes difficult through the mid-1920s. Because as we go from the mid-1920s to the late 1920s, Germany actually starts to recover. What was once a politically unstable Germany finds its footing. Where Germany was once dealing with hyperinflation, 
They've solved their economic crisis. And in part led by this guy, his German foreign minister, Gustav Stresemann. Gustav Stresemann. Germany will become an important player in the world again. He helps work out new loan plans, in part with the United States, that tackle the hyperinflation crisis. He wants to rework the Treaty of Versailles, but he feels that the only way that, that can be done, it can't be done through war because Germany can't have a military. It's got to be done through what's known as rapprochement. I'll give you that word. It's a French word. Rapprochement. We'll use this again during the Cold War. A lot of these words of like international diplomacy are French words. Because French was once like literally the lingua franca of international diplomacy. If you were going for an international meeting in any European city, the language would probably, the meetings would likely be held in French. Your diplomats all knew French. So a lot of these words that we use in international diplomacy, and we'll use a lot of them through the year, end up being French words. This means to like reapproach, to come together. And he thought the only way that Germany could get in, on sound footing again was to come together with France and come together with Britain. And Gustav Stressmann will do this. We talked the other day about the Treaty of Locarno, the Locarno Treaties, right? Germany's in on that. Agreeing to Western European borders. Germany joins the League of Nations in 1926. Germany signs the Kellogg-Briand Pact in 1928. And things are going relatively well. But just like we heard with Japan, just like we heard with Italy, now we're going to hear with Germany, the Great Depression comes. Beginning in 1929, the Great Depression, so we're looking at here, starts in the United States and then spreads to any country that did business with the United States, which was like all of them. The United States, in economic crisis, will call in their loans. We loaned you money, Germany. We need it back now. And we will cease loaning new monies to Germany. German unemployment will skyrocket. This was during the hyperinflation crisis. Everything calmed down. Now with the depression, it's back on the rise. German unemployment skyrockets. People out of jobs, people out of work become very frustrated. And maybe radical ideas from a guy like Adolf Hitler and a party like the Nazi party start to sound appealing. Hitler will portray his Nazi party as the only party that can bring back these jobs and make Germany great again. Well, he probably didn't literally say those words, all right? But, but this is what he's promising. In each national election, as the Great Depression worsens, the Nazi party will gain more votes. In 1930, the Nazi party will go from having 12, only 12 seats in the German legislature, known as the Reichstag. Reich, R-E-I-C-H, means state. The Reichstag, S-T-A-G, at the end of there. That's the German uh, capital building, essentially. In the presidential elections in 1932, the Nazi party will gain more votes than they ever have, over 30% of the votes. And Adolf Hitler will be appointed Chancellor of Germany. He will be appointed Chancellor of Germany. Kind of like the number two behind the president. The hope was, by making a Nazi, making the Nazi leader Chancellor, we could like placate him, make him happy, appease him, give him something to do. And we can keep our eye on him, because this guy's a little bit out there. But we, we can better rein him in. Mental note, in the future, don't make a radical revolutionary your number two so you can rein him in. That might not end well. All right? In February of 1933, the German Reichstag, essentially the U.S. Capitol building, 
where the Congress meets. The German Reichstag burns to the ground. On arson that the Nazis will claim comes from communists. Now, we don't really know where this came from today. But the Nazis blamed it on communists. And they used this, this communist plot to burn down the Reichstag to gain more political power and more political support. In the next election, the Germans will win 44% of the vote in, in Germany. They're growing. The Nazis will win 44% of the vote in Germany. And Hitler gaining more political support along with his Nazis in the government will sign what's called the Enabling Act. The Enabling Act. E-N-A-B-L-I-N-G, like to enable. The Enabling Act, which will give Hitler and his cabinet unprecedented legislative power. Because in times of political chaos, like communists burning down the government buildings, you maybe need more authority rested in fewer hands. Communists will be barred from the government going forward. And now Hitler has all the support he needs to amend the Constitution to his own bidding. State parliaments, like Bavarian state parliaments and other state parliaments throughout Germany, will be abolished. Only one national government. Trade unions closed. This is Adolf Hitler cracking open his dictator starter pack, right? Trade unions banned and closed. Socialist parties and communist parties throughout Germany, banned. On one night in 1934, known as the Night of the Long Knives, mental note, if you hear that the Night of the Long Knives is coming, stay inside. On what becomes known as the Night of the Long Knives, Hitler's supporters struck out against any political opponents, even those within the Nazi party. Hundreds of political opponents to Adolf Hitler, even some of them Nazis, were murdered as Hitler purged any political opposition to him from his ranks. In the next year, in 19... Yes, ma'am. Mo mostly, mostly members of Hitler, of the SA, uh, politi possible opponents to Hitler's uh, political opponents, members of the SA that weren't exactly in line with Hitler's radicalism, they were purged out. And in the next year, the president of Germany, a guy named Paul von Hindenburg, an old war hero, president of Germany, died. And Hitler, now that he can rewrite the Constitution, will merge the office of the Chancellor and the office of the President into one position. And he proclaims himself der Führer of Germany, the leader of Germany. Führer, F-U-H-R-E-R, -E with a happy face over the F. F-U-H-R-E-R, -E over the U, I mean. That's called an umlaut in Germany. He proclaims himself der Führer, the leader of Germany.